Well, good morning to you. It is uh, Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020. Uh, we're five weeks and two days into our lockdown. And uh, it's good to see you this morning. Um, just, uh, I, I've been kind of nostalgic. Started on Monday. I was, I don't know why, but I, I was really, I wasn't like clinically depressed, but I, I wasn't as happy as I normally am on, on, on Monday. I'm not entirely sure why that was. Uh, and then yesterday I went for a walk and I saw a herd of javelina and that made me kind of really actually very happy. Um, and then um, uh, today on my walk, I, I just spent some time reflecting on all the many, many blessings uh, that God has provided in my life. Um, so uh, we'll get into that. But this morning, uh, welcome to you. And uh, if you're joining me this morning, go ahead and say hello on Facebook. Uh, if you're joining later on a YouTube or Facebook, uh, go ahead and post something. It's good to see you, and uh, thank you for joining me on Matthew. Uh, this is going to be in Matthew 16. Um, I, I could show you the data. Uh, it looks like the total cases in the United States have kind of started to go much, pretty much on the downtrend. Uh, deaths, believe it or not, are a little bit higher. Uh, which is not surprising because the peak was about two or three weeks ago, and this is about a three-week thing. Uh, we do have orders from the federal government as to how we can open up. I've been checking daily to see how our governor is going to uh, allow us to do things, and I haven't really seen much direction on that. Um, so uh, I'll get into that later, but uh, but the, the, I wanted to start out this morning to just... Um, uh, to, to let you know how incredibly blessed I, I am um, that, uh, that you would spend time with me this morning. Uh, I'm sure I have a connection probably with most of you. Uh, I was thinking this summer will be 15 years since we started Christ Lutheran Bail. I think we started worshiping in June or July. or We started, uh, I met the congregation in June or July 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, We've been at this thing, and in those 15 years, um, God has done so many amazing, wonderful things at Christ Lutheran Vail, and it's all because of people like you who have uh, poured out their heart and their love and their compassion and their uh, just their whole entire selves into this congregation. And um, what a what a blessing to have been, you know, to have seen it from the very very beginning. Uh, to where it is now and we're about ready to open up a, a building with our worship space and as soon as we get out of this coronavirus thing coronavirus thing we'll be able to gather together and celebrate uh, we've talked about doing a second easter since our first easter we couldn't gather together um, but it will be so wonderful to finally gather together in our new space but it'll be extra special for us because because it will be the first time that we've been able to gather together as a congregation since mid mid March, and here it is coming to the end of April, and uh, just just think of the joy that to be able to see each other face to face, and the joy I'll have to be able to see each of you face to face, and uh, and celebrate uh, together what God is doing in our midst, and to celebrate that we've been able to kind of get through this coronavirus thing, and um, and. Uh, my prayer is that nobody gets seriously sick or dies from this in our in our community, and uh, I'm, I'm just incredibly blessed and grateful for this wonderful ride. I guess is what I want to say, and I'm I'm incredibly grateful for each one of you. Um, I I'm uh, I'm a little bit saddened that I can't see you week after week, and I'm a bit saddened that we can't have that little personal connection. Uh, but I know that that. You know, through some means, you know, we're able to connect a little bit every every morning at eight o'clock, and uh, I just don't want you to forget uh, how grateful I am for each and every one of you because I truly am, and I'm grateful to God for have giving me the uh, the opportunity to be involved in this congregation pretty much from the beginning. So, I am. Uh, I don't know. Today, Monday was a bad day but yesterday was a good day and today I feel great <laughs> I just I, I think it's just uh, being grateful for the things that we do have I mean what a blessing to be on the internet what a blessing to be able to connect on Facebook what a blessing I've been doing zoom calls like crazy for the last five weeks what a blessing that we have that technology available to us today um, because it is so it's so prime for people to be 
isolated and alone and disconnected and no, you know, feel like nobody loves them or nobody cares for them. Um, and particularly to just get disconnected from the body of Christ, but you are not, uh, we are not disconnected from the body of Christ. The body of Christ is doing amazing, amazing things. <clears throat> so, um, that's, that's basically what I wanted to say this morning. Uh, I, uh, so if you're here joining us, go ahead and say hello. Um, and, uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we are going to go into Matthew 16. So Matt, we've been start, we've started to see this now, right? Uh, Jesus did his teaching, then he did a bunch of healings, then he sent out his disciples. Uh, then uh, Herod kills John the Baptist. Uh, Jesus is still doing more teachings, but we saw a couple weeks ago that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have realized that Jesus is a threat. Um, not only a threat to them uh, personally, because they are... Uh, they're the ones you know that believe they have a handle on God or you know got the finger in the pulse of God, but also they are the ones that kind of have made this deal with the devil of Rome to create stability in their community. And now with Jesus, he's gonna he's gonna destroy all that stability and things are gonna fall apart. And so they've decided that they can't have Jesus uh, anymore. Uh, and so they're plotting. Two chapters ago, we saw how they're plotting to kill Jesus. So that was the first kind of like in this love story uh, that we've got, this first kind of indication from Matthew who's writing this, that something's afoot. The, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are kind of all plotting now to kill Jesus. And uh, so we're going to see that today. We're going to see in very many ways how the Pharisees are still after Jesus. They're, they don't know how they're going to do it. They still have to follow some laws. You know, they, they can't just go and kill the guy. They've got to find something in him that is worthy of death. Uh, and so you'll see now till, till his death, you know, little ways the Pharisees and the Sadducees are looking after Jesus to try to find that little one nugget so they can go after him because that's, they're absolutely convinced that they have to do that. Um, so we're going to start in Matthew 16, verse 1. Let me just move over this. I do, by the way, I do have my email open if you wanted to send a message or a comment uh, I'm going to be looking over there periodically. I'm going to make sure that this is working. Last week, uh, it went off for a little bit. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 1. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. He replied, when everything comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearances of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation look for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jesus or the sign of Jonah. Then Jesus left them and went away. So again, we see the Pharisees and Sadducees after Jesus. And now they come to him and they say, we want a sign, right? We've heard you're doing all these miracles. We've heard how you've healed the blind, the deaf, the mute, the lame. Uh, how you've done all these amazing things now, you know, you've calmed the weather on the lake. We've heard about that. We've heard all this stuff. Now we want to see it for ourselves, right? We've just heard it hearsay from other people. We now want to see, uh, we want you to prove that you, who you are, right? Because if you're not going to prove who you are, then we're going to continue on the path that we're going to destroy you. But maybe, you know, maybe they'll relent or whatever, but Jesus, Jesus doesn't give them a sign. Jesus says, the only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah. Of course, we know the sign of Jonah. Jonah, the Old Testament prophet, uh, God told him to go to Nineveh. Uh, Jonah resisted. God had him swallowed by a whale. Uh, Jonah, realized, okay, Jonah realized, okay, maybe I should go to Nineveh. So he goes to Nineveh. And, uh, but he was in the whale three days, right? So what Jesus says is that the only sign you're going to get is that the sign of Jonah, which of course is an allusion to the fact that Jesus will be dead for three days and then he will come back from the dead. Um, just a couple things here. First of all, the fact that, that God, you know, when he put this plan into place to send Jesus into the world, to be born in Bethlehem, uh, to grow up, to do his public ministry, to die and rise again, that when he put that plan in place, he also put a plan in place years ago that Jonah would be swallowed by a whale and that he would be in the whale for three days and then he would be spit up. Um, 
It, it's a pre, it, the, that whole story is a precursor or a prototype of the story of Jesus, right? And um, it's uh, that, that God would have the foreknowledge to do that so that when Jesus came out of the grave three days later, I mean, that he could talk about this sign of Jonah in his public ministry and that there was a sign of Jonah. I mean, I just, I just find sometimes the, the miraculous forbearance, foreknowledge, you know, the incredible plan that God has for mankind. And it just didn't happen with the birth in Bethlehem. As a matter of fact, it didn't even just happen with, with Noah or Jonah. It didn't happen with Noah. There's stuff with the signs of Noah. Uh, it didn't even happen at the fall. From the creation of the world, God knew uh, kind of what he was going to do, how this was all going to play out. And uh, he had a plan for the whole thing. And I just, I'm amazed by the incredible power, knowledge, wonderfulness of God. It's pretty neat. Um, so that's the sign of, jo of Jonah. Jesus says, listen, you know, you can, you can see, you can look in the sky and you can tell what the weather is going to be like, you know, in the coming up. Um, what is it? Red sky at morning, sailor, or red sky at night, sailor sleep tight, red sky at morning, sailor take warning. I mean, this is basically what Jesus says to them, right? You can look at the signs in the, in the sky and you can see the weather, but you can't predict you're supposed to be uh, so connected with God that you can understand his heart and how to teach the people, and yet you cannot see what is right in front of you. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a horrible, horrible uh, uh, accusation against, against the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they cannot see the fact that Jesus is who he is, and they want a sign, and they can't see the signs. I mean, it really is horrible, um, but they can't because... There is no sign that would have shown the Pharisees and Sadducees who Jesus is. I mean, even if Jesus did a sign right there in front of them, they would have gone back and they would have debated themselves and they would have talked themselves out of the fact that Jesus truly was from God, right? Because there is no When your heart is as hardened as the Pharisees and the Sadducees were, there really is no sign that's going to change that. I mean, look at, the, look at the resurrection of Jesus. You think that would have changed the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You think that every single one of them would have said, well, I remember when Jesus said three days and Jonah and all that, and he certainly did, and now he's raised from the dead. I mean, all that sign, and they still didn't follow Jesus. They still didn't see the signs. I mean, when you are, when you are as entrenched into their, their position, their power, their their false connection with God that they had, that, you know, the, the power that they had, then no sign would have really helped them at all, period. Um, and, you know, it's something we struggle with, too. Uh, we want signs from God. God, show me your signs. Show me that you are God. Show me something, Lord, to show me that you exist. I mean, I think that would be the thing in today's world. Uh, in previous generations, people pretty much believed in God, but they didn't know which God or are the signs that, that they needed to believe in. Today, if you look at the world around us here in the United States, people just want a sign that God exists. Of course, God gives signs all around, right? Uh, you go out and you see the beauty of creation. You see the intricacy of how the body is put together. You see the amazing fact that our bodies can fight things like the coronavirus. I mean, you just, you look at all the incredible things of creation and it's not a sign for us, uh, for the world around us. I mean, it's a total sign for me. I see it completely as a sign from God that he created all of this for my enjoyment and that he exists and that he loves me and Jesus, you know, is his only begotten son. I, uh, I have, I don't know how you could not look at creation and come to the, to come to the grand conclusion that God exists and he's, that he's a God of love. I, I just don't know how you can do it. And yet you were surrounded by people that look at creation and think that it's just kind of a random chance, um, that, it, that there is no God, that there is no creator of the universe. Um, God doesn't exist. Uh, he certainly doesn't exist in Jesus. I mean, these are the things that the world around us believes. And I, I, I don't think for them there could be any sign. Um, the, uh, sometimes we as followers of God. We want a sign. God, show us something. Show us something that you exist. But he's never going to. I'll never forget, uh, there's a guy named Paul Meyer. He's a, a professor in Western Michigan University or something like Michigan State. One of those Michigan universities. And, uh, 
and he gave a, a conference once that uh, I attended, and um, he said something that really stuck with me. He said, God always leaves room for faith. God always leaves room for faith. So if God's going to do a sign, he's not going to do a sign that is so powerful that it completely destroys and rips the need for faith in your life. Um, because you, we always need that, that seed of faith that's continuing to grow in our life. Because if God shows a sign to you that is completely 100% without a doubt uh, from God, and you know it's from God, those typically, those signs are, are accompanied by things that may be uncomfortable for you. I mean, look at Moses, right? Moses was going, saw the burning bush, and God gave him a sign. He said, this is the burning bush. This is the sign. He speaks to Moses out of the burning bush. He says, take off your shoes. And then he gives Moses a task to go against the most powerful government that was in existence at the time of Moses. And he says, go to the guy in charge of that government and tell him to free my slaves. I mean, <laughs> that's... Uh, or, or look at uh, uh, Abraham, right, who has this son named Isaac. And, uh, and then God comes and speaks to him and he says, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac for me to show me your faith, right? Uh, this is something I want you to do. Uh, so, you know, getting these complete, vivid, absolute signs from God, they're not necessarily always wrapped up in a bow because when they do come, they usually come with a commission and oftentimes those commissions are things that are very scary, perhaps even dangerous or deadly, or things that you do not, absolutely do not want to do ever. Uh, and yet, these are the things that God, that's the way that God operates. Um, he always leaves room for faith. And if he doesn't leave room for faith, he's giving you a commission uh, that oftentimes isn't something that's going to be very pleasant in your life. Uh, just put it that way. Um, we, are, we, do, we are creatures of free will. And as creatures of free will, um, we can go against God. But once, once God comes into you absolutely in your life that you ab he destroys your free will, then you have no choice but to follow him exactly the way that you should follow him. You almost become like a, like a I don't want to say a slave, but you become enslaved to the will of God uh, without any will of yourself in that. And God does, very rarely in history has God done that. God always leaves room for faith. And it's the same thing here. Um, you know, the miracles that Jesus did, uh, all you know, raised from the dead, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they still didn't see that as a sign, even though Jesus told them it was going to be a sign. Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, I was, um, uh, there's, a, there's a preacher who was very popular maybe 40 years ago who had a sign from God saw a 75 foot Jesus and told and God told him to do something. And I've always I've always wondered in my life, do I want a 75 foot Jesus or would I have to be ridiculed and um, would people be angry at me? Uh, would people doubt that? Um, because if I got the sign and nobody else did, um, <clears throat> I'd have no choice but to follow that sign. And, uh, and to lead, you know, in that sign from God when nobody else would have seen that sign. And uh, that's a, just a very, very difficult thing, very difficult thing. But again, the, I spend time in prayer with God all the time, asking for his will and his guidance in my life um, and, and, uh, and asking, you know, for deep wisdom. So anyway, all right, so that's... that's uh, beginning of this thing. So uh, we see now that, uh, that Jesus is having it out with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We're going to go on in verse 5. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Human thing, right? So they get across, oh no, we have no bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they go across the lake and they forgot the bread. And then Jesus says this other thing, which is, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then the disciples are talking amongst themselves and they're like, oh my goodness, this, this thing that Jesus said about, about yeast, it must be because we forgot the bread. Oh Lord, we're so sorry. You're rubbing it in our face. Um, and then uh, Jesus goes on. 
he, sa uh, he says, aware of their discussions, Jesus said, oh, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourself about having no bread? Do you not still understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you've gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls of that you gathered? And we just saw those two miracles, right? Remember, you know, bread isn't that important to me. <laughs> I, we can make bread out of, we can get bread and fish. We, we have control here. And how is it that you do not understand that I wasn't talking to you about bread? When I talked about yeast, I wasn't talking about the fact that you forgot the bread. Oh my goodness. But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they understood that he was not telling them to be on their guard against the yeast used in bread. <laughs> be on your guard about yeast but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, so Jesus oftentimes talked in parables, right? I mean, he talked in alliterative language, or not alliterative, but allusions, uh, analogies. He talked in ways that connected to people at a deep level in these stories, uh, but not everything was that, right? Um, and so, so when, the Pharisees, when, the, when the disciples hear about yeast, you know, they're trying to figure out an exact hard thing. Okay, what did we do? Why is Jesus talking about yeast? But Jesus is still talking in an analogy here, right? He's like, no, no, no. He says, I want you to be aware of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their yeast. And what is the, the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? What is the teaching that Jesus tells the disciples to be aware of? Uh, we could look back um, and, and look at this, these encounters with Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For me, um, when I think about this, I think it's just the mere hypocrisy that the Pharisees and the Sadducees have. I mean, they basically said, you know, we have a handle on God. We know what God wants. And yet when God shows up in presence in front of them, they don't see it. They still put this burden of law in on all these teachings on the people. They don't see God's grace. They don't see his love. They don't see his compassion for the people. They're, they're strangling the people with the law and, they're, and they don't understand that God is also a God of grace and love and compassion, and they don't give that to the people. Um, and they're so hypocritical. I mean, they say one thing and then they do another. And uh, God, Jesus says, just don't be like them and be aware of those teachings. It's a yeast that can come into any culture and it can take over that culture. And then the culture becomes all about the law and it never becomes about, about God's grace and about his love and about his compassion. I think about our world today and um, do, 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 do the people of our culture here in the United States, when they see the teachings, when they hear the word Christian church, um, one of the things I think that I hear all the time and probably for the last 20 or 30 years is that, is that repeatedly and more and more generations simply see the church as unloving, uncaring, it's all about the money, uh, it's all about having control over the world and, and exercising, exerting our force as a church to, to get laws passed, uh, you know, so that we have power in the church around us. And, and it's rare today, uh, you know, particularly, even though I think there are a million stories about the wonderful things that a church does, right? the wonderful, great love and compassion that a church has for community. For some reason, those million stories always get drowned out by the few stories of some crazy churches that are using their platform of the internet or you know, saying crazy things to be picked up by the news media, you know, being crazy on the, on the church, uh, you know, and not all of them, but, but a lot of them, you just look at them and you say, man, you're not, there, there's not a whole lot of love there that I'm seeing globally, like in our, in our, the public perception of church is just not very well done. And that's unfortunate because it makes, like one of the things I'm so proud about for our particular congregation is how much we do, we try to love the community around us. And, um, and I don't think we do it just because we want kudos or stuff like that. So we don't publicize it. We don't, you know, do uh, uh, you know broadcasts of it to you know to show the world how great the church is? We just we just humbly follow God, doing the things that He's called us to do, and uh, we don't get a lot of press for it. 
and it gets drowned out many, many times by these national uh, preachers, I guess I want to say, that really don't necessarily show the church in a good light. Let's put it that way. So we have to fight against that. And, um, but that's, that's, the way, that's the way it is. I mean, and God, Jesus said, right? He said, um, beware of these teachings, this hypocrisy, this power struggle of, you know, this desire to be in charge of culture around you because it, it'll permeate the church. And sure, over time, it has permeated the church. I mean, the leadership of the church always struggles against um, power and corruption. And then you'll see a reformation of the church and it'll kind of knock it down on its knees and it starts over again. And you see another reformation, knocks it down on its knees and starts over again. I mean, you always have to fight against this charge of people who are in charge of churches getting addicted to the power and the fame and, the, and all that sort of thing. Uh, and not just simply humbly loving God and following him. I mean, so he's, he's absolutely right about that. Absolutely right. Uh, and uh, so we're going to go to verse 13. Verse 13 then is, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So he's going around, he turns to his disciples and says, who are people saying that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist. Remember, John the Baptist is dead, uh, but now maybe he's come back alive and he's Jesus. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He's the Old Testament prophets. I mean, obviously this guy is around, he exists. Who are people saying I am? And they're just like, well, maybe John the Baptist, or Old Testament prophet. Uh, but Simon Peter but what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, remember, Simon Peter's my favorite disciple. Simon Peter's never cautious. Simon Peter never, Peter never thinks twice. He just, he just blurts out what he's thinking and he follows, he loves Jesus, right? He just absolutely loves Jesus. He wants to follow Jesus. He wants to, to be Jesus' right-hand man. You know, he just wants to be there in the presence of Jesus. And he shouts out and Peter answered, well, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are now Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Oh my goodness, there's so much here. So uh, let's, let's go back to who is writing this, right? It's Matthew. And what is the main theme of Matthew? It's to show that Jesus is the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. We've seen all the way in the first 15 chapters here that every once in a while, Matthew will quote an Old Testament prophet to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the words of the Old Testament prophet. And then right here, this encounter between Peter and, and Jesus, uh, where it just is laid out. Now Matthew makes it absolutely plainly clear that Jesus now is the promised Messiah because Jesus said it himself. I, you know, who do people say I am? Oh, you're Elijah, you're John the Baptist, but who do you say I am? And Peter, well, you're, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, yes, that is true. But this was not revealed to you by me. It was revealed to you by God but don't tell anybody. I mean, so, uh, so now, now the gauntlet is thrown, right? Now there's absolutely no doubt that Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. All the Old Testament prophecies, all of them pointing towards a time when someone would come from God to rescue Israel, Jesus is now the one. The gauntlet's been thrown, the charge is, is and Jesus is like, don't tell anybody. Do not tell anyone that he's the Messiah. But the disciples know, and the word's going to get out, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are going to see that Jesus is not some ordinary man, and they're going to kill him. Um, it's so much uh, interesting that before this time, uh, this fisherman is called Simon, Simon and his brother Andrew, and um, they were fishing in the boat, but Jesus now changes his name from Simon to Peter. In the Greek, the Greek word for rock 
is Petra. So Jesus changes his name from Simon to Petra, which we call Peter now, but in the Greek it would have been Petra. And then Jesus says, and I tell you, Peter, Petra, that the, upon this rock, I will build my church. And what is the rock that Peter is, what is the rock that Jesus is talking about? So just a little bit of church history uh, for the first thousand years of the church, uh, they believed that the rock was Peter. Uh, the Roman church in Rome, which was basically just, the, as the church grew, you had different regions where the church existed. The highest person in charge of that region was called a bishop. The Roman word, or the, the Latin word for that is pope, right? So you have all these different popes. But the Roman Catholic Church, because Peter ended up going to Rome and dying in Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church that Peter is the head bishop of all the bishops. And upon his church, he, uh, Jesus, established the church. Uh, and so Peter is the head of all the bishops, according to the church in Rome. And, that, and that's the way they've operated up until the present day. We are the best church. We are the only church because Peter is the rock of the church, and he's the one that started the church of Rome. I disagree with that. Because if you look in this encounter, he says, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, uh, I tell you that on this rock I will build my church. And for me, this rock is this confession that Jesus is the Messiah. It's not Peter. Um, and I can see how you could say that Peter is the rock. And Peter was a solid rock of the Christian church. You have the two main rocks of the Christian church. You have Peter right here commissioned by Jesus. And then you have Paul, which happens in the, in the book of Acts. You have Peter and Paul as the standard pillars of the church, of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, absolutely no question about it. But I think that the confession of Peter, that Jesus is the Messiah, is the rock. And he changes Peter's name to the rock. Um, but I don't, I don't necessarily think that Peter and the church in Rome is the, is the, the super, super uh, bishop or the pope of all the Christian church. You know, it's interesting. How much time do I have? Okay, so it's interesting that uh, up until the time of uh, 1054 AD, uh, there was no split in the Christian church in the East and the West. All of that whole entire region was under one pope uh, up until 1054. And then in 1054, you had the, what's called the Great Schism, and the Eastern Church, which was based in Constantinople, and the Western Church, which was based in Rome, they split. And we say that's the major schism of the church. But here's, here's the truth. There were still pockets of Christianity existing even outside of the Eastern Church and the Western Church. You had the Coptic Church. Uh, you had the Ethiopian Church. You had all these little churches that grew around outside of, of kind of the Eastern Western split of church. I mean, we know that some of the disciples went to Asia. We know some of the disciples went farther into Africa. I mean, there, there are churches all throughout and not all of them were part of the Eastern Western church that was split in 1054. You still had little pockets of churches. And in these pockets, there is one person in charge of all of that. And that person is the, the bishop, right? Uh, in our particular uh, in our particular denomination, we have a president of our denomination, and that president is in charge of a large group of people, but he is not subservient to the Pope in Rome. Um, the Pope in Rome is just a bishop, and all these other people that are in charge of denominations, they're just bishops. And in theory, all of these bishops should gather together theoretically, and maybe someday under God's grace, they will all, all these bishops of all these different congregations and churches throughout the region, then maybe they'll all come together and join together as one again and be a unified church again as one. I have no idea. But we, we do make a lot of inroads. We are trying to reach across, you know, tribes and try to, you know, do that. But in the age of the internet, I mean, they could actually bring all the bishops together 
for a conference tomorrow if they wanted to and put them all in a Zoom call, except there'd be thousands of bishops. I don't even know how you do that. Um, but any, anyway, so uh, Peter is, the Roman church believes that Peter was the first pope because he was in charge of Rome. And, um, and it's, it's from this passage right here where Peter, upon this rock, upon you, I'm going to build my church. You're going to be the number one person. He ends up in Rome. So that's how Peter ends up being in charge of the whole entire Christian church for 1,054 years, except for the pockets of churches that existed outside of Peter's control. All right. Um, and then I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So this um, is what's called the kingdom. This is called the office of the keys in the Roman Catholic Church and even in the Western Church. Uh, this is where Jesus says, if you forgive sins, they're forgiven. If you uh, don't forgive sins, they're not forgiven. And the power to forgive or not to forgive sins comes from this passage. And historically, the Christian church has elevated certain people from within their congregations or within their denominations for the power of forgiving and not forgiving sins. And this happened up until the time of Luther. And then Luther said, wait a minute, we have direct access to God. The power to forgive sins is not necessarily invested in just one priest, right? Which is uh, what, what this person would be called, a priest. And what Luther said is we're a priesthood of all believers. And anybody can announce the grace and the love of Jesus. It doesn't have to come from a priest. Um, so uh, we believe, we believe being the Protestant church, that this power to forgive sins doesn't come from any person, but it comes from the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, there are so many places where it says that God forgives the sins of the repentant of people. And so if you speak those words, uh, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will cleanse our sins and forgive us from all unrighteousness. It's 1 John, right? It's 1 John 1, 7 and 8. That power is not invested in the priest. That power is invested in the word of God. The power to forgive sins is because God's word says that sins are forgiven for a penitent heart. That's where the power resides. It pow the power is from the word of God. Is a very much Protestant way of looking at things. Um, and uh, so, so we, uh, while we still do have, uh, at times, public confession and absolution of sins, the absolution doesn't come from the priest. The absolution comes from the Word of God. It's a very important part. And uh, let's see. So that's called the Office of the King, the Keys. Whatever you bind on earth is bound, but we believe that it's from the power of God's word. Then he orders disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. All right, we're going to go on. Verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples. <laughs> they did not hear it, though. They did not hear it. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. Remember the chief priests of Sadducees, right? Uh, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life, right? So I don't know how much clearer you can be. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be, I'm going to be suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and I will be killed. And on the third day, I'll be raised to life. Peter took him aside and said, Never, Lord, this shall not happen to you. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. This is pretty sharp words from Jesus to Peter, right? And of course, it's Peter who's, who takes this step. No, Lord, not you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some of you are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. All right. So Jesus lays it out clearly. I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. Peter says no, and they still don't believe it. Even on the third day when they go to the tomb, they thought they were going to find Jesus, right? They were going to anoint Jesus with oils and give him a proper burial, but he was raised again, even after he told them. Because the resurrection is something so far out of their mindset, they couldn't even, even when Jesus told them, I'm going to raise from the dead, they couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe it. And yet, this Jesus gave them clear instruction, clear teaching is exactly what was going to happen. And the second part of this is that what Jesus is telling them is that death is not the end. Even if you lose your life in the kingdom, it is not the end. And if you want to save your life, uh, whoever, what does he say? Whoever loses their life for me, if you lose your life, even for me, you will find everything. Um, what is it good to gain the whole world but not lose your life for Jesus? What Jesus is saying is that you're in my kingdom. And being in my kingdom, you may or may not lose your life. But that's only a human life because once you're in the kingdom, you find life and you find it to the abundance and you find it to the full because I am life. And you are in my kingdom now. And death, even death, does not separate you from my life, uh, from my love. Uh, even death does not make you eternally gone, right? Because once you're in the kingdom, you are in the kingdom forever. You're with me forever. It starts now. Um, and understanding that and losing your life for Jesus puts you in a kingdom that will never go away. Uh, it's, it's an absolutely incredible teaching. And he told it to them, and they still, uh, they still didn't believe it because it was, too, it was too far out of their mindset, right? Um, it probably out of our mindset too, but the fact that you are in the kingdom with all the blessings and the rights of being in the kingdom are yours. And it starts today for the rest of the world, you know, for eternity. You are in the kingdom. You are in the arms of Jesus. He loves you. Every, every right that you have is yours now in the kingdom. I mean, it's a huge blessing. And that's losing your life to that is the best thing that you could ever do. Understanding that your life is now Jesus' life and his Hands and, your, your hands and feet are now his hands and feet. And the love that he gives you is now the love that you, you know, give to the world. Uh, you know, and, the, and the sacrifices that you might make now uh, are come back to you a hundredfold in the kingdom because you're in the kingdom. Everything that you have, it's gonna, everything that you have in this world is nothing compared to the life in the kingdom that starts now. Um, so, uh, and that's really losing your life. So, um, Jesus laid it all out to the disciples. He completely laid it out. They heard it, but they didn't believe it. But they, they will believe it. We'll see when we get into the end of this, this book. They do believe it. So that's going to be, I think we're going to end there today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, and let's close in prayer. Jesus, you are life. And you bring us into your kingdom. The kingdom of which you are in charge a kingdom that will never go away. And Lord, uh, we thank you that you have brought us into your kingdom and you give us your love and all the rights and privileges therein. Uh, continue to be with our world uh, as we struggle through this virus. But Lord, we know that even death does not separate us from your love. For this, we thank and praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so that's the teaching for today. Uh, tomorrow we're going to Matthew 17. We're getting closer. May you have a wonderful day. Uh, have a blessed day and uh, we will see you tomorrow. All right. Take care. Bye.